Welcome to Speechless, and hey, St. Paul, we are live in St. Paul today. This is the first time that we are live for the show, and we're glad to have you watching. Call your friends, let them know. This is a call-in show, a talk show, and uh, please, uh, you're going to see our phone number and call in. See who can be the first one to call in from St. Paul with your comments or questions. Uh, I'd sure appreciate that. Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm guessing. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Depends on what you say, but you're more than welcome to call in. And also, uh, you can watch past shows on youtube.com backslash speechless MN. And if you have any comments or questions, you don't want to call in, but you want to uh, have some ideas for the show, contact me at speechlessmn at gmail.com. And today, what we're going to do, of course, like always, we've got breaking news uh, on this show and what's happening in our judicial system and our court system and some of the travesties going on. We're going to update you on a lot of those. But I'm going to tie in a number of things today. I'm going to tie in the anti-bullying bill that passed the Senate today to the movie that's out, God's Not Dead. Just saw that today, give you an update on that. And then the cost of constitutional violations of the Minnesota government. I'm going to tie all those three things together to the common denominator, and I think we'll have a fascinating show. Uh, but first of all, for those that, for St. Paul, the people in St. Paul, you usually see my show a week or two delayed. And because of that, you won't see last week's show, which I think was a fascinating show. It's about Hobby Lobby. The Minnesota Supreme Court had just come, just heard a case about Hobby Lobby and their religious freedoms in relationship to the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. And I showed you video that you won't see anyplace else but this show about the le from the legal counsel of Hobby Lobby and one of the employees there talking about Hobby Lobby, what they do, why they do it and the process that they've been going through with this court battle. It's fascinating, but you're only going to be able to see it if you go to youtube.com backslash speechless MN and or you can Google Tim Kinley speechless and Hobby Lobby see what comes up. Uh, the last week's show should come up. So um, go watch that, not now, a little bit later. Uh, and then also today, the U.S. Supreme Court, I believe, rightly ruled that anybody wanting to contribute to a campaign could contribute as much as they want to. It's called freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press. And that there were these campaign restrictions uh, put on individuals and that it lasted this long is just bizarre to me. But it's just the culture and the mindset that says only certain people can have free speech and not everybody gets it. And that was the, the whole idea behind this McCain-Feingold, that only peop people could have so much speech and not anymore. And that's why I just couldn't support John McCain for presidency, because he just doesn't get it. And I don't think he ever will about what our Constitution's about and... Uh, what free speech is all about. And of course this show is about free speech. And to that end, next week, again we're live in St. Paul for the first time tonight, but next week, our second time live, Greg Worsell will be on the show who's a candidate, who has been a candidate for the Minnesota Supreme Court, who has sued uh, basically the judicial system in Minnesota, not technically, specifically, but the Lawyers Professional Board of Responsibility because free speech rights were violated and he couldn't campaign and he couldn't have freedom of association in his campaign in an election for judge. Went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, won that case. He'll be on talking about that case and what's currently going on to limit uh, attorneys and judges' freedom of speech in Minnesota. And it's amazing to me that Minnesota, with this great judiciary that we have, the best in the world, according to testimony down at the Capitol, that they don't understand the concept of free speech for everybody. 
and uh, they still have to restrict it in order to feel good about themselves somehow, some way. And it's not the, it's just, it's a, it's a mental illness going on inside our judiciary that they don't get this stuff. After that, the net following week, we'll have uh, former Representative Dan Severson, who is running for Secretary of State this time around, and also uh, ran for the U.S. Senate and Secretary of State before. But he has been one of the leaders on the charge of uh, judicial reform and exposing some of the judicial corruption going on. But I think this show will be more about his run for Secretary of State and what are the issues regarding elections and the duties of the Secretary of State in Minnesota. So you're going to want to watch that. Uh, but today, um, we're going to start talking about this anti-bullying bill. And we're not going to start. You can see my past shows. This anti-bullying bill is a, it's not a good one. North Dakota's got a good one. The, the Republicans in the House and Senate tried to put in and amend in a good anti-bullying bill that treats everybody the same, that doesn't take away parental rights, that doesn't uh, deny due process, that doesn't have the schools looking into a student's social media. Uh, this, this is a problem for this anti-bullying bill. But um, it passed in the Senate 36 to 31, pretty much um, a party line vote there. However, uh, this bill is going to have lawsuits written all over it. Uh, there is no way the government should be looking, and the school's a government. Don't, uh, you got to understand that the school is the government. They're given government funding. It's a constitution, constitutional aspect of our state that the schools exist, and they have no right to look at anybody's social medias, any minor social medias, without the parents' permission. Um, and but that's what they would be doing here. Parents would not be notified if their child is accused, and therefore lack of due process rights. A child, a child could be harmed for life with the effects of this anti-bullying bill, but it passed 36 to 31. And if you saw some of the committee meetings that were going on, and, and especially the education committee with uh, Taurus Ray, my title for this whole hearing would have been, uh, Senator Taurus Ray bullies through the anti-bullying bill. <laughs> you know, that's essentially what happened. And of course, if you're up in the uh, White Bear Lake, Maplewood, Matamita area, your senator, and well, Oakdale, North St. Paul, Senator Wigger has been pushing uh, this anti-bullying bill too, uh, which does treat students differently and doesn't protect everybody. There's a much better way to go, but we got what we got. Now this bill has to go uh, uh, to a conference committee to work out the differences between the House and the Senate and uh, then it goes back to both houses and then they vote on it uh, up or down for whatever the conference committee comes out with. So uh, the anti-bullying bill, and then there's a movie out now called God's Not Dead. I just saw it today, uh, had a great time watching that, uh, good company, and this movie is based on real life uh, circumstances, real life events, that took place among many of our college campuses. And what you found out, there's a lot of court cases regarding religious freedoms and the right for freedom, freedom of expression of your faith and professors forcing children, uh, not children, adults, they're 18 and older, adults to write in order to pass a grade, in order to get a good grade, God's dead. God is dead. You have to write that on a piece of paper. And it's based on a true event, but they co-mingled about uh, 20 true life events into the story, and I thought they did a very good job uh, about religious liberties. And it was just fascinating to note that this professor in this movie was a bully. He behaved like a bully. He acted like a bully. Everything he did was being a bully. He de de uh, dehumanized Christians. He dehumanized people that didn't agree with him. And you just have kids sitting there just soaking it in. And what can you do? You either got to do what the professor says or you get a bad grade and you don't get to pursue further uh, goals that you have in your um, education career. So 
great movie, but again, bullies. And the, I, I just couldn't, you know, just fathom this, that here we got these government institutions, um, like our legislator, really supporting bullying. That's the net effect. They're going to be the bullies. And the professors at the universities uh, bullying the students. And then we come to our own legal system here in Minnesota. And, and when you have police officers, prosecutors, judges being the bullies and violating the laws, in order to protect themselves uh, and deny our constitutional rights as uh, people of this country, uh, they end up being the bullies. And I'm going to update you on a couple cases here. Now, Jim Bergstrom, who had the 50-year restraining order put on him by uh, Judge Hennon, who in my mind, in the way she runs her courtroom, the way she treats people, she is a bully. In my opinion, she's a bully. She acts like that. She tries to alter the events and intimidate the attorneys into changing their testimony and changing their approach to their case. And I've watched it with my own eyes. She's in Washington County. She should not be, be a judge. She's uh, as biased as you can get, in my opinion. But she, Jim Bergstrom uh, had a false OFP put on him. Uh, Oakdale Police, when the order for protection came against Jim Bergstrom, he was at his place of worship, uh, and his ex-wife comes in and comes to his church and says, oh, Jim's violating the order for protection. She's never been there before, okay? And she shows up at his place, but she notified the Woodbury police two days before that she was going there in an email. And then... She shows up, but calls the Oakdale police because that's the jurisdiction it was in. And Oakdale police comes out for this violating an order for protection. And they look at what's going on. They talk to the pastor. They talk to people. They find exculpatory evidence, evidence that would contradict her story. And they said, there's nothing here. We're not arresting him. And um, he hasn't violated his OFP. You're setting this up. So o Oakdale police does nothing. Two days later, Woodbury police show up without a warrant. Two days later, without a warrant, break into his, uh, Jim's house and arrest him. And then they throw him in the slammer for 55 days and uh, late filings all over. They know the Woodbury police knew it was fraud from the beginning. And they promoted this and the prosecutor knew and they kept pushing this and finally after 55 days they dropped the charges. And so now there's a federal lawsuit going on. It was dismissed with prejudice at the district level. It went to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. They reopened it. It's back down in district court. They had their first hearing and um, uh, pretrial and the process is reopened again and it's moving forward. But these Woodbury police officers that are cited in this lawsuit, in my opinion, have been bullies in this situation. They knew they violated the law. Now, the same thing goes with Andrew Henderson, who was filming an event outside his apartment building, outside where he lives, and the sheriff deputy shows up, and there's a medical emergency, and he films the event and he gets his camera taken away from him and um, by the sheriff's deputy. The sheriff's deputy, with 30 years of experience, goes and takes the video camera home that night. Doesn't go and take it to and put it into the evidence room and secure it. She takes it home. And guess what? She watches the video. And oops, it gets deleted. 30 years of experience as a sheriff's deputy. Doesn't know how to handle evidence? Hmm. Andrew Henderson was charged by the city of Little Canada for uh, violating privacies. And, of course, they had the jury trial, and he was found not guilty. And, um, and hopefully he will sue this deputy sheriff uh, for uh, destroying the evidence and violating a whole lot of constitutional issues, but never should have been prosecuted in the 
first place. Never should have happened. But that's what's going on. That, those are some updates of what's happening. But these, some sheriffs, some police officers are being bullies and violating constitutional rights. Now, I'm going to bring on my special guest because we have other updates on some other issues that he knows about. And actually, I was going to bring him in further but earlier, but I forgot. But John Miser, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, you bet. Uh, you have a lot of experience with some of these uh, bullies out there uh, in the guise of having a uniform. Uh, but we talked on this show about the Michelle McDonald case who got right. arrested as an attorney for taking a picture in a courtroom before a court case. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. That was sh what she was accused of. Now, there was just a hearing Monday Monday on this where she was... Mm. The, and the charges were dismissed. The charges were dismissed on her case. Yep. So they went through this whole rigmarole, right. uh, a number of hearings, had a special judge in this case. Yeah, brought in a special judge, and I forget the judge's name at this Les moment. Leslie Metzen. Leslie Metzen. <coughs> uh, wife of State Senator Metzen. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, a retired judge. Yeah, and specifically dealing with all of Michelle McDonald's cases. Yeah, yeah. So following this up, and it's kind of you know it's interesting, but a little back and forth inside between the prosecutor or the judge on who was going to dismiss it. I don't fully understand really? the politics on that, but eventually, the the uh, the judge stepped up and dismissed the charges because it didn't rise, didn't have probable cause, didn't meet the probable cause standard burden. So the uh, um, they actually had a discussion as to... I don't think it was in the court. It's just oh, sort of, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, so they're going to see what's, what's the best way to deal with this. What's the best way to deal if with this? If the prosecutor drops it, it's, not, it's done. Right, it's done. If no, the yeah. judge drops the charges, there can be an appeal. Right. There could be an appeal. So, so the prosecutor can appeal no. this decision and say, yeah. no, they were wrong. Right. But if the prosecutor just goes away, the judge can't do anything. Right. There's no case to appeal. There's no nothing. Correct. Um, it would be over. And the prosecutor might admit that, well, you know, boy, this is pretty aggressive kind of prosecution. Now she's been found, you know, uh, innocent of it, not guilty. Right. So... It'll be interesting to see what happens because... But no she jury not, trial found No jury, jury trial. Account. No, judge, uh, judge decided this. Uh, I think it was at a contested omnibus hearing. Right. I don't really... Yes. So, yes. so this is before the jury trial. Right. So at this contested omnibus hearing, the judge just said, hey, you don't have enough evidence. It doesn't rise to probable cause. We're you know, dismissed. Right. The charges isn't going to go forward, which in a sense finds her innocent. Right. That they never should have brought the charges to begin right. with. So that kind of opens up the, you know, depending on what they want to do, is to go after the prosecution for malicious prosecution. Can they do that? Well, it's, uh, mean, we, it, you can once you've been found innocent. Okay. You know, in this case. So it opens them up for that. So the prosecution's got to find out what do they want to do. So that may give them an incentive to continue to appeal it. But doesn't the prosecutor have some protections in this? Well, theoretically, they've got immunity. Immunity. Theoretically, they do, but you know, depending on uh, the circumstances, if they can find, if they act outside the scope of their authority. <clears throat> but I don't know if it's going to, you know, push to that level. I, I mean, I have no clue where where this is going to go. But it's a, uh, it's it's a balance of like the prosecution never should have been pursuing this. I mean, this to well, me just was kind of retaliatory uh, kind of stuff going yes. towards her because of the kind of cases that she's representing to protect people's uh, un unleanable rights. Right, and it was Judge Knutson who issued in Dakota County who issued the oral warrant yeah. for her arrest, which you can't do Correct. unless the judge sees the uh, uh, crime or problem, disorderly conduct right then and there. Right. Uh, but since he did not see it, then the two deputies came in <laughs> right. uh, it, and said, Judge, uh, this person took a picture in the courtroom. One, one, they didn't know that she took a picture. Right. They saw a flashlight go on. That doesn't mean the picture was taken. But she still has self-defense rights, too, even if she did take a picture. Right. Due process. Due they got to follow rules. You know, you know they, they, the public servants don't get to break rules to enforce rules. What? Right? Isn't that kind of unique? The pub, you know, the name of the game is break a rule and pay. Do right. The for, for, yeah. Right. Do the public servants get to break rules to enforce rules? 
Uh, they shouldn't. Right. That's due process. You know, but they, when they do break a rule, you're saying they don't pay. They don't pay. But it certainly doesn't look like it. Or the process is just a whole lot harder for them to it's be held accountable. Yeah, it's kind of like a Vegas casino. The odds are stacked against you. Yeah, you, you think? Know? <laughs> you think so? Yeah. Uh, it's not too often that prosecutors go after uh, police officers or judges or uh, unless there's a lot of public outcry yeah. pushing them on. Well, they're kind of like a, it, it, it appears to me, it seems like they're kind of like a team. I mean, you got the prosecution come over there and always says, representing the state, uh -huh. right? Who's the judge get paid by? The state. Hmm. You got yeah. the state and the state, and theoretically they're independent, and they all talk, and they all pal together, and, you know, you got the state against the individual. Right. Because the judge works for the state. Yeah. Kind of a problem there, isn't it? Well, it is. Um, so McDonald's case has a lot more potentially going on, but she's got federal lawsuits in this case. Yeah. Uh, and she's also got some other bad behaviors of uh, being charged with a D DUI. That she's here. That hearing is uh, tomorrow uh, morning. Right. And of course, this is a case where <laughs> well, she gets pulled over, and the cops begin to start to manufacture evidence. Right, because they had no reason to pull her over. No reason to pull her over, and she went to the hospital right after the whole incident and took a you know blood test, and it you know reported zero alcohol, zero drugs, zero you, alcohol. Yeah, you got the cops down there saying, well, you know, we smelled alcohol. Her eyes were bloodshot. She was blurry and she was slurred. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she was pretty on top of it because she said, look, I'd like to, uh, uh, Minnesota Statute 169.91 states on, on an arrest, I've got the ability to demand, to demand to be taken before a judge right now. Right. So she starts to apply a rule saying, hey, right. these, these are your rules. And I'd like to, to, and they go, no, we're not taking you. Right. We don't have to. Because she said, get me before a judge because you guys are acting out of order. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't do it. So actually, you know, a cover-up starts right there. Exactly. So that hearing's tomorrow. Yeah, that hearing's and tomorrow. So we'll see how it goes. But she's got the evidence from the hospital. Nothing. Right. right. Gave, it to, the, gave it to the police chief and said, hey, here's, here's exculpatory evidence. Yeah. Uh, and he's going, well, no, don't give it to me. No, you need to see this. Because if you yes. guys are going to continue to prefer charges. Which they have to, by law, look at exculpatory evidence. Right. That, that exculpatory evidence is evidence that contradicts evidence. The so-called yeah, well, evidence that, 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 that contradicts that, the story. Well, contradicts the story and diminishes the ability to convict. Right. And if, it, if, it, if, it, if it's exculpatory, you have to take a look at it and go, oh, wait, we shouldn't be charging this person. And there's, um, oh, I just lost the case, but there, you know, there, there's good case law on this. But there's a, uh, the, they've got the burden to, pr to provide this. The right. prosecution under their rules of discovery, rule 9.0.3, .9 .0 has in there, I think it's 0.6, exculpatory evidence. And if yeah. there is exculpatory, they got to give it to you and say, hey, this will, you know, and they really have to act on it. Yeah. Well, in this believe, Andrew Henderson case, taking the video of the sheriff deputy, and she takes the evidence, it's a $50 fine. It's a, a petty misdemeanor. For filming? Yeah. Uh, but he got found not guilty, but the city of Little Canada spent well over $5,000, in my understanding, to mm. prosecute him for something that wasn't illegal to begin with. Right. Because he had that right. And that's what the jury found out. Now the, that could be appealed uh, up to the appellate court. And, but I, I doubt that will happen. But there's definitely going to be a, fe I, my opinion, there should definitely be a federal lawsuit. But they're, they're chasing after some people, I think, in order to control everybody else. And, but what's happening is some people are starting to stand up right. and actually address these issues. You're starting to stand up. I mean, well, you just got out of right. being detained or right. in a cell. You were arrested right. uh, last Tuesday, right? Yeah, this previous Tuesday, uh, there a, uh, a false arrest warrant issued uh, March 25th by uh, the Scott County prosecutor, uh, Bill Strait, sought a, uh, an arrest warrant for a failure to appear. At a court hearing. Okay, and that's that's standard procedure. Sure. These, uh, failure to appear. So right. I mean, they happen all the time. And, right. And people yeah. could have things scheduled out three months ahead of time or two months, and circumstances they just forget. 
<laughs> right. I mean, I've even done it once. Yeah. You know, you just get down there and take it care of right away. Sure. But it's but just, it's a right. common act that you really don't want to do. Right. But in order for one to forget, one would have had to have been noticed. Oh, you so weren't noticed? I wasn't noticed. So how can I forget that which I never knew about? Boy, they're going to have a hearing, uh, but you're not. They noticed. were going to have a hearing. Uh, March. You weren't served. March. I wasn't served paperwork. So okay. So how could you show up? So in order for a warrant then to take place, my understanding, for well, not showing up, the prosecutor would have to say, we, we noticed them. Right. We noticed them. Okay. So, so that's what happened then, right? Uh, right. So basically what happened on March 14th was the day I was supposed to show up uh -huh. to have a hearing. And I wasn't noticed, so I wasn't there. Okay. So the prosecutor had to go before judge, uh, before the judge in Scott County, Ann Offerman, I believe the name is. Yep, okay. Ann Offerman. And uh, uh, present to her, uh, hey, Miser is not here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's supposed to be here. Here's evidence that we noticed him. So on the record then, on the registry of actions, it said failure to appear March 14th. Okay. So now you weren't there, but she actually said, here's the evidence? Well, I, I don't know what they said because I wasn't there, but yeah. there's a thing called the, the registry of actions. Right. You know, I know the viewers probably can't see this, but uh, you know, you can well, look, look, you can look, at you look up the case number. It's 70-CR. Dash fourteen dash twenty four sixty two, and if you look up that case number, um, that'll pull up the registry of actions, and it'll show that on the fourteenth uh, it says failure to appear. Then on uh, March twenty fifth, um, <clears throat> Bill Strait went mm -hmm. before Judge um, Christian Wilton down there, mm -hmm. and he went to him and said, "Well, I would like an arrest warrant to issue because we had a failure to appear." And he's, all, all the proper rules have been followed, so would you please give me an arrest warrant sure. for John Miser? We need to go get him. Sure. Okay. On the 25th, Judge Wilton issues an arrest warrant. Okay. Wait, wait. So, uh, wait, w on the 14th? The 14th that was to appear. They, uh, yeah, and so and they I, asked for a arrest warrant right uh, then. No, no. Oh, they, really? They waited, they waited uh, you know, it looked like almost, what, 11 days. That's weird. Eleven days because well, usually the arrest, war arrest warrant goes out that day. I mean, it doesn't go out, but okay, it may take them a day to process it. But they ask for it that day. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So yeah. Okay. Well, for some reason, they waited eleven days. Okay, and, and that he went would before be the sheriff. He he went before a second judge. So uh, Bill okay. Strait, I believe it's Bill Strait because he's the lead prosecutor on this. Um, uh, that he went through and asked for uh, you know a warrant. Okay. So. Um, by luck, I happened to be in a different county over on a different hearing, and, and I had somebody come up to me and go, hey, there's an arrest warrant for you, just mm -hmm. this past Friday. They gave me a tip-off, and they said, hey, there's an arrest warrant. I went, oh, okay, I didn't know about that. And I go, well, you know, and, and this sheriff just said, I'm not arresting you. But go take care of this. I just want to let you know. So be, mm -hmm. beware. And I thought, wow, this guy has, you know, wow. is, is demonstrating discretion. And I said, well, how does one, right, <laughs> how does one, you know, be guilty of that when they were never notified? And he goes, well, it doesn't show me in the registry of actions that you weren't notified. Actually, somebody had to testify that you weren't right. or something. That's what he said. So I said, okay, thanks. So what I did is this Monday, I wrote a letter to Judge Christian Wilton. And I said, hey, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I want to make you aware, I believe there's a false warrant out there for me because I never got notice. Hmm. So, but there's an arrest warrant out there for me and I'm scared. I got to go to a hearing Tuesday this week and there's an arrest warrant out there for me and I never was served anything. Can you please take care of this? Or can you tell me what you intend to do to handle this matter? Mm -hmm. I copied the original judge, Judge Ann Offerman, Okay. I copied Scott Joint Prosecution. Uh -huh. I, Scott, I copied the Scott County Sheriff, Kevin Studnicka. Uh -huh. I copied Lori Swanson, the Attorney General. And I copied a, an individual named Brandon Stahl, who's the watchdog reporter for the Star Tribune, who covered sure. the, that story about the judge with no oath. Right. I called Monday afternoon, and I left messages for the prosecution. 
both Patrick Siliberto, who's the county sheriff for Scott County, and mm -hmm. for Bill Strait, and said, hey, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. There's a warrant out there. I got to go show up in court tomorrow, and I don't want to get, you know, right. mugged. Right. Can you please do something about yeah. it? Well, I got no phone call from them. Sure. And as I come and walking down. And now they know you're going. To now they know I'm walking into Scott there. County. I'm going to go there. So I come walking down. and I'm So walking. you're not hiding or anything? No, or I no? come you're walking just... down to the courtroom and uh, coming into, <clears throat> I had a hearing. My wife was attempting to get an extension on an OFP, like you were talking earlier, mm -hmm. on an order for protection. And uh, all of a sudden, these officers come up and they grab me and they go, you're under arrest. And they, mm -hmm. they grab me. They throw my arms behind my back. They handcuff me they, right out there in the public. And I'm saying, it's a false award. It's a false arrest warrant. I'm so they, you know this. They, they use some significant physical force well, they, just you know, to jump on you. me. There were two you, guys yeah. grabbed me and, uh, and then uh, walked me back and went started the booking process and threw me in a cage. That's kind of interesting. When I was at uh, Anoka County for a court hearing when I got arrested, you know, I was saying hi to the sheriff. They knew I had a court case. The bailiff was there. And, and I just said, I, I know what you have to do, you know, but I, I got my court case here. And then when it was done in the room, I walked over to him and turned around. Wow. I, mean, he, he, I mean, he said, sure. I, I got to arrest you afterwards. Right. That was totally different than your experience. No. So you even notified you're coming. So they don't need to do that. Right. They don't even need to do this. And, and Bill Strait was there. So he, yeah. he knew what was right. going down. I mean, he knew what was going down because then I had a friend in court. So here I am sitting in the, in the, in the, uh, in the cage and uh, I'm waiting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, about 30 minutes pass yeah. and I get released. They go, okay. put on your coat, put your belt on, put your shoes back on. You're released. You're good to go. You're, not, uh, you're no longer under arrest. Okay. And I go, what? And they take me to the courtroom, and I didn't realize it, but I really was in kind of a state of shock. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was just discombobulated. You, you, you don't realize it. I, I don't even know it, and I'm, I'm kind of just traumatized, and I, I really didn't know what was going on. And the next thing I know is I'm sitting here before, uh, you know, an, another new judge, Diane Hansen, and all of a sudden she calls the state of Minnesota versus John Miser, and I'm going like, I don't even, I'm not even aware of that case. I'm here for Miser versus Miser. Okay. But what I learned from my friend who was there while I was incarcerated, Bill Strait and the judge had an ex parte hearing, and that basically means I'm not there. Or your representative. Or a representative, and I'm representing myself, so I'm not there. I didn't even know to show up for this case, so how do I even, how did I even know to get representation for something I don't know about? Remember? Right. That's why they had their arrest warrant. Well, this arrest warrant was for Miser. Th this was, was, was the Miser versus the state of Minnesota. Okay. The, the right? arrest warrant. Right. Okay, sure. And for, for failing to appear, for but, they, to but appear. they failed right. to notify me. Okay. But apparently, Bill Strait is talking, Prosecutor Bill Strait is talking to the judge, and uh, uh, they decide to quash the arrest warrant because they didn't have, they hadn't followed the rules. And the rules say you got to notice somebody in order to get it. So they <laughs> quashed the motion. And, and I, I talked to an individual in, in, the, uh, you know, in, in, in the law enforcement department, and he said in, in his 30 years, he's never heard of somebody being arrested, incarcerated, and released within 30 minutes. He said it just never happens. Hmm. Wow. And I think what, why that potentially happened is because I sent this letter out a day beforehand, made calls, and said, you know, please don't abuse me. Right. Help me. You know, take care, there's a problem here. Right. But they didn't. Right. So I, I was, you know, uh, then subjected. So go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I hear a couple things here. One, you had a friend that was in the courtroom. Right. It's so key because these things happen where they will take people out of a courtroom and remove them. And you need to have your friends there so that they hear the conversations going on because they will try to remove you so, so that you don't know what's going on. Right. But you had a friend that was able to tell you there was this ex parte meeting going on, which you would have no way to know about. Correct. Without that friend being there. And that's breaking the rules. Absolutely it is. So they go through and, and uh, you they, know, They make this. the decision before right. you even know there's a decision to be made. Right. And what was really a tragedy is on Monday, before my hearing for the OFP thing, but now that I know there's an arrest warrant, I called the court clerk and I said, I'd like to schedule a motion to quash. 
I'd like to schedule a motion oh. to quash because I want to be protected when I walk into court. And they wouldn't let me do it. What? I, I tried two or three times with the court clerk. I said, look, I just want to do this. I want to be safe. And they said, no, we okay. won't do it. You need to talk to the prosecution. Okay. Well, did you file a motion to quash? Be no, because they wouldn't give me a date. I was trying a, to get a yeah, date yeah. to oh. do my motion. I thought, well, okay, okay, I'll talk to the prosecutor. All right. I haven't done this before. Right. <laughs> You're right. May, maybe you can do an eliminating motion or a motion to be heard before. Before you get hammered. Before that court case, court hearing that you, you know, didn't know was going to happen. You know, Tim, strip <laughs> off their costumes. <laughs> Strip off the costumes yeah. of the law officers. Yeah. You know, take them off. Right. And if all of a sudden you're on the side of the road and somebody grabs you, throws you into restraints, mm -hmm. and puts you into cage, they call that kidnapping, don't they? Absolutely they do. Right? And then they also call that assault and battery because they're right. touching you and putting their hands on you and groping yeah. on you, and you, you're not consenting to any of this. Right. But all of a sudden you put on the, the costumes... And all right. of a sudden, it's an air of legitimacy, and they don't even think that they've damaged you. Well, there, there is an air of legitimacy when it's legitimate for them to do that. But in your case, it, when I'm hearing, it wasn't legitimate for them to do it because it was based on false information that they knew was false. Somebody that, knew it was false. Well, and that they, right. they procured themselves. They made it up themselves. Right. Right. I think the prosecution made this up. They knew what was going on, and they just said, well, let's just go get this guy because, you know, I don't know. I'm, I, all I can do is speculate. I mean, this no. is the same county where I've been calling them out yeah. on no oaths of office and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I then followed up with a letter the next day to the, uh, the Judge Wilton who issued the arrest warrant, and I said, hey, I sent you guys notice. I asked for help. Nobody came to my help. I mm -hmm. was assaulted and battered mm -hmm. on Tuesday. I'm writing to him on Wednesday, and I go, why'd you guys fail to act? Why did you fail to act? Why did the sheriff's department fail to act? Why did the attorney general's office fail to act? I let everybody know ahead of time, mm -hmm. before the crime was committed. Mm -hmm. Right. And nobody acted. I mean, and, nobody and then acted. when they did act, they acted. Well, then all of a sudden they acted within 30 minutes and go, well, right. we, made a, we made a mistake. Right. Let them go, but the damage was already done. Right. I then had to show up at two hearings, one which I never even had notice of, and I was in a state of shock. Well, I want to I wanna look here. Let's go a little bit further back to the beginning mm -hmm. of why you're such a bad person. Okay. And why you have this OFP going on. Right. Um, and, and why you didn't, sh well, we already know why you didn't show up to your OFP hearing because you weren't noticed in order for protection hearing. But what was it that you did to violate the order for protection? Well, I think are we, being accused of. Right. So what I'm accused of, I think we got a picture. So yeah, maybe we bring Nathan the picture Ken, up number here. Number eight. So we got a picture here. And, you know, just so they see it, this is, this is the complaint. Well, we'll see that in a second. So there I am. There's a picture of uh, father and son right there standing next to a nice car. And we're taking a picture together. And I send this <clears throat> because my wife is no longer allowing me to have my parenting time. Um, even though you have court-ordered parenting time. Even though I've time. got court-ordered parenting time, and that's, that, that's just another story I don't even want to go down right in now. Itself, yeah, okay. Um, I send her this picture because it's like the day before my birthday or something like this, and, uh, and, sh and she's not going to let me have my son to be together with his birthday. You know, mine's on the 11th of November, his is on the 16th, and we usually try and do something to celebrate together. And okay. That's not going down. So I send this picture, and it says over there, you know, Hi, son. And actually, it said his name, but I just took it off. And I said, you know, uh, you know, Daddy loves you. And, and this is the crime. Well, this is the crime that that is, uh, you know. But doesn't your OFP say that you can't have any contact with your ex-wife or contact with it, your it son? It says I can have contact with my wife regarding my son. You know, regarding okay. my son, <laughs> religious, medical, so educational. So there is no OFP against you doing communicating to your son? Well, c I, I communicate through her through, you know, email and or text. Right. On messages. Right. And you have the right to see your son, yet she's denying that. Right. And you know, so, so, right. So she had to go down to the Prior Lake Police Department. Uh-huh. Show him that picture. Show him that picture and talk to Officer uh, Dwayne Goldhammer, who, okay. by the way, doesn't have an oath of office. Wait a second. 
this is this is an issue that you've addressed with the courts before. So we're going to get into this oath of right. office, but let's talk about uh, yeah, Dwayne so, here. So Dwayne right now. No oath sees, of office. No oath of office. But even before we can go to the fact that he doesn't know how to follow the rules, uh -huh. he's taking a look at that picture, and he goes, wow, I think we've got a crime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? We've got a crime. Okay. He would have to up. read the order for protection. Right. So he did. And it's he all did. in here. This is the prosecutor's thing. 54 pages of, uh, you know, their manufactured material about the picture. Okay. So Officer Goldhammer says, well, I met Camille. She came down here. She showed me the picture. And, you know, here's a, you know, here's a copy of the picture uh, on this report of, um, you know, what we're doing here. Uh-huh. And... Uh, he so, so he put the picture in the report. Yep, he put the picture in the report, and, uh, you know, there's the picture in the report, uh -huh. right? Just the one that we showed your viewers right. on the screen. In, in color. In color, and uh, <clears throat> he said, okay, this is a violation. He, he also said, uh, my, uh, you know, t uh, my son's grandmother, you know, wanted to invite him to his grandfather's birthday. And so they're saying that's third-party contact by my mother. So a whole... You know, but this was the the, the well, picture with the car. Well, that depends on the that depends on the order for protection. That Doesn't isn't say. always right in there, and it is not always part of the uh, order for protection. Correct. Correct. So I mean, they're just looking. So, anyways, within their judi within the police discretion, they go, "This is a crime." So they write up a report and they send that to the prosecutor. Kay. Now the prosecutor's got to wade through these things and go, right. "Should I charge or should I not charge?" Mm -hmm. Well, I guess when he looked at that picture, he went, holy cow, we better go charge. Yeah. Well, let's go spend some of the county's money and go after this guy. And what does it mean go after, you know, this, this fine, so the viewers know out there, can be 90 days in jail mm -hmm. and a $1,000 fine, mm -hmm. plus probation costs that, out, that work up to seven dollars $800 for probation periods, and then they get additional court costs. They can really start to gin up some money here. Well, and this would be a second violation of an order for protection. Would, not, well, not a second violation. No. It, it would be the second order for protection violation. That's the right way to put it. Thus earning you the potential of a 50-year restraining order. Sure, could be that. But the first one hasn't gone through to, uh, to a trial yet. Oh, okay. And that one was for sending a text message, please don't sell my property. Uh, which the judge had told her not to do when she was selling your property. Correct. And, so I, and I filed the so police report. The police so go, well, we're not going to touch that. So you're acting in self-defense. Right. Uh, you know, because I had to furry, uh, you know, money for my son <clears throat> to go through and there for this allegation of potentially sending this text message, which they're going to go through. And part of self-defense is giving a warning. Well... Whatever. I mean, that case is still under right. review for what they're trying to do with it. So they 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 got to you know pull that all together. But it's it's uh, fascinating how they go after this. So the prosecutor decides to go prosecute it. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did. Okay. This is Bill Strait's work. These are the fifty-four pages of his work of coming after this charge. Now, Bill Strait is aware before this arrest warrant even issues because I provided him the evidence going over to the oath that I had, I decided, you know, if the name of the game is break a rule pay, right. let's go find out if the public servants are following their rules. Right. Because they've got more rules to follow than we do. Right, they do. So <clears throat> I made a request on uh, February 27th to the um, people where they, you know, 358.11 says they file oaths with this city clerk. Mm -hmm. So I asked the city clerk, I said, I'd like to get the oaths for the city manager, Frank Boyles, for the chief of police, Bill O'Rourke, for the mayor, for the city council, and for these officers, Goldhammer and, uh, and Roska. See okay. if they've taken oaths. Well, it comes back to me, hey, city manager doesn't have to take an oath. Wow. Chief of police doesn't have to take an oath. The, the city said this city said this yeah kelly myers who's the uh, person who does that down there of, said, of what city again city of prior lake city of prior lake okay. said on march 12th <clears throat> i'm advising you the city manager is an at-will employee the city does not administer an oath Whoa. of office for the city manager position chief of police is an at-will employee city does not administer an oath wow you know it's bizarre you can go look up on the internet youtube and you can see the saint paul mayor swearing in in 2011 the new chief of police right you got to take an oath uh the maplewood they 
just swore in a five new police officers a couple months ago. Right. It's the stand. I it's mean, just what you do. You but, have to do it. Right. For any office. Right. Right. Now. Whether they're elected or appointed. Right. Well, what is that? Do you have some constitutional <coughs> issues with this? I do. This? I do. So, okay. you know, I, I've put together a little sheet, one page sheet here on uh, <coughs> oath of office authorities. So let's just start. So the first one is the United States of America Constitution, Article 6, Clause 3, states senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several states' legislatures and all executive and judicial officers both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath. That means you have to s publicly swear an oath to the Constitution right. and sign a document saying such. And file it. And file and it. And Minnesota Constitution is Article 5, Section 6. It, talk, it talks about oath of state officers, where they got to do it. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. Constitution says you got to do it. The state constitution says you got to do it. The Minnesota legislature then provides and interprets that 35805 oath of office before transacting any business or exercising any privilege of such office shall take and subscribe the oath. Shall take and subscribe the oath mm -hmm. before transacting any business. So can a police officer do anything? No. Nope. Can a chief of police do anything? No. Nope. Can a city manager hire anybody to do anything? No, no, they can't. Can a judge do anything? No, they have to sign it's the It's pretty oath. clear. And then it says yeah. where well, they got to file it. Okay. Judges have to file with the Secretary of State. People in the cities have got to file with the city, you know, there. I mean, it uh -huh. describes where they got to file yeah. it. And then 35102 says vacancies. Every office shall become vacant upon the happening of either of the following events before the term of their office. If the incumbent refuses or neglects to take the oath of office. Refuses they, or neglects. They're out. How they do they you, vacate the office. You, you, and how do you know the distinction between refusing or neglecting? Doesn't matter. Well, I think that's the point. Well, it, it doesn't matter. Because someone can say, I neglected, but they were really refusing. Right, they, maybe that's it. Maybe they're refusing because then they can go be a bully. Yeah. And so if they, so they're not authorized to act, they therefore vacate the office, even though they still got the costume on, mm -hmm. right? They look like a judge or they look like a police officer because they got the costume on. Then they're but an they're imposter. Not, right, they're an imposter. And so then Lori Swanson, you've got an, uh, another statute called 55601 called usurpation of office. And you basically say, <clears throat> when the attorney general has reason to believe that a cause of action can be proved, the attorney general may bring an action in the name of the state, upon the complaint of a private person. <coughs> oh, that'd be you. That'd be me. And you when complained any, to the when attorney general. When I complained general. to her, I said, when any person usurps, intrudes into, unlawfully holds, or exercises any public office or any franchise or any office in corporation created by the authority of the state. Police officers created by the authority of the state. Mm -hmm. City managers created by the authority of the state. Mm -hmm. Judges created by the authority of the state. Mm -hmm. They're usurpers. Right. Usurpers. They're all usurpers. And when any public officer does or suffers any act by law which causes a forfeiture of office, hey, forfeiture of office must have been when they vacated. Right. So how the heck do they get to occupy? They're a usurper. So Lori Swanson isn't doing anything because I've notified her. Mm -hmm. And so really, where do you go to get a remedy around here? Oh, that's if a good question. If these people are running. Well, I would think the remedy would be the legislature in their powers to impeach uh, and to discipline judges and governors. They can do that. That's part of their constitutional duty. When others aren't doing it, it's their job to step up. Right. Uh, but that's not happening. Well, and they don't want to. Well, is it a that's case fun. of um, the laws apply to one class but not the other? I think there's a, a reality there. I think, yeah, or, or probably more accurately, the protection of each other. Right. Which would, well, I mean, if, uh, if, that if, would apply to one class versus the other. Well, I mean, if you were driving and you didn't have, uh, you hadn't bought insurance, and they, they gave you a ticket for that, yep. you'd have to pay, right? Or you would. So that law applies to you. Right. And if you didn't have a driver's license, would, and, or, or you didn't yeah. wear your seatbelt, or you had a broken taillight, 
and they wrote you a ticket? It, it would apply. Okay. They would say it would. But so, this doesn't apply to them somehow. But these laws, the Constitution doesn't apply to them? Right. <clears throat> the right, fact of course that they not. Got, so, I mean, you <laughs> it's know. It's just a piece of paper, John. <laughs> right, right. With words on it. You know, there, there's a guy that I used to study, uh, you know, who I studied well, was a management consultant. His name is Peter Drucker. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and basically he said, uh, you know, um, you right. can't manage what you don't measure. Mm. Well, if we don't measure the public employees to find out if they're following, right. then they're not being managed. And no wonder they, they appear to be running around very, very loose. Good. Because yeah. nobody, I mean, us and other people, People have got to start managing these mm -hmm. people and following them and holding them to task. So what I'm hearing you saying, based on this failure of this police officer to file the oath of office, uh, the charges should be dismissed. He well, has no business uh, arresting anybody or charging anybody. Any of his past activity, anything he has done, whether he's been involved in a search, uh, any evidence, any testimony is null and void. Right. You'd think so. And <coughs> how long has he been around? Since 2000. He hasn't done an oath since 2000. How often years. does a police officer have to do an oath? Once. I mean, when they get into yeah. a term of office. Right. So if they're an appointed thing. Anytime they go to a new city or, right. or a new A new job, term, just like we saw with term. Obama. I mean, that's really clear. You know, he was yeah. elected the first time. Right. He took an oath of office. Yeah. In fact, he had to take it twice because there was a mistake. So they wanted well, to get it correct. But... And for his first term. Yes, and then the one out at the front of the Capitol is all show because he's already done the oath of office. They do it that right away. That was the away. second one. No, they, they have to do it on the 20th. They actually have to do it on the 20th right. of January. So it's very specific in the Constitution. But he that. has no powers until he takes the oath. Correct. Correct. But you're looking for a police officer, but prior to that, you found an oath of office not signed by a judge. Right. And right. that was? Carolyn H. Lennon. And that case is right now before the Supreme Court. Of Minnesota. Of Minnesota. And they get to make a determination what trumps. Because what the judicial class is saying is, well, we the don't got to. Class. We don't have to. Because well, we, created, we created our own case law. Uh -huh. And we call it the, the de facto doctrine. Okay. So the judicial class created their own set of rules that said, we don't have to. And then you've well, got the Constitution the, that says you've got to. Right. So Madison versus Marbury basically said the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Mm -hmm. So the question before the Supreme Court is what trumps judicial rules? Right. Or the right. or or the you know the Constitution. That's the question really before the case with you know Lenin and and the court. Does she or so, does she not? So a de, a de facto is that what you said? De facto doctrine. De facto doctrine means what? De facto doctrine means, well, they, uh, they had some defect in their title, but actually they were still good to go. Okay. Uh, isn't there another form of type of judge? Um, de jure? Well, if you have everything put together, then uh -huh. you're considered de jure. Okay. So you've got all the credentials. You've judge taken the, the oath. You, you have the, the proper election certificate or right. appointment certificate. You've got all your paperwork right, just like a person driving in their car. I got my driver's license. Mm -hmm. I've, got the, I've got the insurance card. <clears throat> I've right. got the ownership papers. I've got all my documents in place. Right. Therefore, you know, maybe we could call it the de facto driver's mm -hmm. doctrine. I had a seatbelt on. I was driving. I looked like a driver. I knew how to start it. So you uh -huh. know what? I don't have to have those credentials because I'm, I'm a de facto driver. Right. How about that? Yeah. Maybe we can all use that argument. Sure. We call it the de, de facto driver doctrine. Right. We're good <laughs> to go. Then the rules don't apply to us. Sure. Well, this is a quagmire that the uh, courts are in with this Judge yeah. Lennon not signing her oath of office out <clears throat> of uh, Scott County. Out of Scott County. Yeah. Uh, for three years. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the Attorney General has been notified and is not doing anything? Yep, I, uh, I wrote her a letter on the um, <clears throat> usurpation of office. Huh. I'm going to have to ask her that question. Well, what's really interesting, too, I think I've got it here somewhere, okay. but for the Attorney General thing on the usurpation of office, I sent him a certified letter. Uh -huh. So it could you know, prove to me that they received it. Mm -hmm. They did, and then I called up about a month later, and I called into their office. I said, hey, you know, what's going on with that? Oh, we don't have it. I said... Here's the certification number. Mm -hmm. Where is it? And then they scrambled around, scrambled around, and they said, well, I don't know. It's not in our system. 
I said, do you guys usually lose certified letters that prove <laughs> they were delivered to your office? So <clears throat> I don't know what's going on with that. So I faxed it back to the gentleman and uh, you know, hopefully they're gonna do something. Well, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, and that needs to be dealt with. And there's a lot of these court cases that are 14 months, nine months out. You have to wait for uh, Irby versus the state of, state of Minnesota versus Irby or vice versa. Right, you have right. to wait for that decision that's already been heard in the Minnesota Supreme Court. Even though it's not really the same set it's of not, facts, you know, it that was about a judge that whether she yeah. resided in the district or not and one who didn't and she right. was sanctioned. Right. And so, you know, they were challenging that case saying, that hey, it she says didn't have really clearly to hear this if, and if you don't reside, you and, vacate. And vacated, right. And so the court is in this quagmire and they're not doing anything about it. No. Yeah, it's... John, well, I'm grateful for you Thanks waking for up people. On. Yeah, you know, Tim, I appreciate I'm it. For hey, St. Paul, hey, welcome. Glad to have you here live. And uh, remember, next week, Greg Worsell, U.S. Supreme Court candidate in the past, going to update on the courts. Dan Severson, the week following, running for Secretary of State. And remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Is it intended to provide parents with the insecurity of knowing